So I'm Rachel Payne, I'm co-chair of the Hardwick Conservation Commission. Um, and we're very pleased to have Michael Lee Smith of Arrowwood Environmental here to explain about natural resource inventories. Um, the first questions come up for us also when we started learning well, just what is an, an inventory and how is it made, um, what it can and cannot do, and how it could be valuable to the town and residents of Hardwick. Um, and as Michael had pointed out, we know a lot about our roads and our houses and our shops, but um, things that you know everyone in town is familiar with, but what do we really know about uh, the back hills and the pools and the streams and the forests and so forth. So this is um, when an inventory is so incredibly valuable to figure out what animals and plants and insect life uh, share this land with us. Um, so what we expect, and, and of course Michael's going to get into all of this, but this is, you know, where are the deer yards, where are the vernal pools, and um, also places that landowners also might want to be protective of, as well as the value in town planning. Um, the Hardwick Town Plan also uh, insists that we do a, a, a natural resource inventory, so uh, that's also part of why we're here. That is something that the town is invested in. Um, and I think I just wanted to say that this is an early stage in this process. And as time goes on, the Conservation Commission will be uh, conducting some outreach and community involvement, as well as fundraising, the inevitable fundraising that we will um, undertake uh, to pay for this um, valuable report. Um, Hardwick Conservation Commission meets once a month on Tuesday, third Tuesdays, here in the Memorial Building, and we are um, always looking for an interested citizens and new members. So I will turn it over to Michael now. Um, with one exception, there is a sign-up sheet, and if everyone could just sign up, that you were here. If you would like further information, to be on our contact list, you could put your um, email there as well. So thank you for Michael. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so. Uh, Yes, I'm a town resident, but also work with uh, Airwood Environmental, uh, and we do all kinds of uh, environmental consulting all across the state. Um, as I go through this presentation, if you have any questions or want to heckle me, whatever, just interrupt, um, and we can get that taken care of. So, the town natural resource inventory. Uh, this is what I'm hoping to address today, uh, and we'll go through each one of those. So you, so you folks have a, kind of a broad idea about what this whole thing is and what you can do with it. So first of all, what is it? We take uh, foundational things like bedrock geology, superficial geology, and soils, and on top of that, lakes and streams, uh, and some of the information that's known about wetlands, and we create a uh, um, map, uh, natural resources, a natural communities map for the town. And based on that, it includes wildlife habitat as well. Okay? And so we're looking at, um, at the, the wetlands, we're looking at upland forests, and we're looking at wildlife habitat. Okay? These first things, the, um, the bedrock geology and the soils, we don't do new mapping of those. Um, those are mapped, um, and for the most part, you know, fairly well. Um, that's a completely different undertaking, but the data exists. And so we use that data, as, as well as the lakes and the streams data, to create um, new uh, information, new uh, layers of, of the natural communities. And I'll get more in depth about what, what that actually involves um, a little bit later. So why conduct an inventory? As Rachel pointed out, it's very important for town planning, and a lot of town plans actually request or require that the town undertakes a natural resources inventory to figure out what kind of resources you have in your town and how are they best managed, okay? Uh, it's important for public and private um, land management, okay? So basically, you, if you want to manage something well, you have to know what you have, okay? Uh, you can target um, 
areas, certain areas for conservation or restoration. And that can take place on a town-wide scale or on a property level scale. Yeah. Uh, revising out, out, um, outdated data. Uh, regulatory predictability is also uh, a really valuable outcome. And in a way, the, the whole regulatory piece can sometimes rub, rub people the wrong way. Uh, and <clears throat> it, can be very, it can be very difficult to perform parts of the inventory, especially like the field inventory component, um, because some people are very concerned about the regulatory aspect of things. Um, on, in some towns it's happened, there's actually been kind of backlash against this process because of the, the regulatory issues, okay? And so I think it's really important to be upfront with people about what you're planning to do, what you're not planning to do, and also point out that the, the predictability is really the key feature there. Uh, you know, typically you'll have um, some concerned landowners that will be like, I don't want anyone on my land. I don't want to know what, I, what you think I have, okay? And I'm against the whole process. And that's fine. Um, but the, the key here is that um, if you know what you have on your land, you know what you shouldn't be doing. Like, it's better if you have plans for your property, say you want to you know, build another house or something, um, it's really important to know what you have before you get into trouble for building someplace you shouldn't be building, kind of thing. Um, this was kind of a long-winded piece about the regulatory um, uh, predictability, just as kind of something to be aware of. It's generally not integrated into the natural resources inventory, okay? Um, and so it's really not a part of the, the kind of gathering of the scientific data, but I just wanted you to be aware that it can be an issue sometimes, okay? Um, and then finally also to raise awareness um, about um, what we have in the town. So how is an inventory like this conducted? Okay. The first step is to gather existing data. And like I mentioned with the geology and the streams and the lakes, that data is already out there. Okay. And so we kind of, kind of compile that all together. There's data from Fish and Wildlife about, um, say, potential deer wintering yards. Um, there's data from um, Department of Environmental Conservation about um, wetlands in the town, okay? Um, and all kinds of, this is, a lot of this data has all been digitized now and we can look at it on the computer um, in different layers and I'll talk more about that in a second. So the first step is to gather existing data. A lot of that data is, uh, you folks can all check out now on the Vermont um, Agency of Natural Resource Atlas. Um, they've kind of compiled a lot of that on this mapping tool. It has um, much of the data that we kind of use for starting out the, the natural resource inventory. The other way we gather existing data is uh, we get input from people that, that live here, okay? Uh, and there's lots of ways to do that. Sometimes there's public forums and we can talk about it. Uh, oftentimes we will set, uh, develop an online map that people can enter data into, like, oh, I, you know, I know that there's, um, <clears throat> there's a bear travel through this area, or I, I know there's a rental pool here, or I know there's a really cool ledge habitat here, and I can add this data to the map, and then we incorporate that in to our process as well. And so once we gather this existing data, we basically look at it in different layers. And the beauty of the, the GIS application is that you can lay down your streams, then your lakes, then your wetlands, then your steep slopes, and then your soil types, and your bedrock types, and forest types, and you can, get, um, you can look them all together, okay, in, in many different ways. And so from those existing layers, uh, we can start to get an idea about, um, you know, what's in the town and, and pulling together to start mapping um, the new features. Okay? And then, so we do this, uh, basically, we gather all the existing data and do a rem remote map uh, using orthophotos and slope and all the other data. And once we have that remote map, and then we target areas for the field assessment. Yeah. <clears throat> the field assessment is 
uh, critical because a remote map, it, it, it's remote, right? You, you can't get as good data as you can if you actually get boots on the ground and you can walk in, in the woods and the wetlands, okay? And so the field assessment is a really critical component of the inventory. It's also uh, time consuming uh, and it's also limited by landowner permission. Typically. Is that done after you've done these layers? Yes. So yep. It's not instead of or before. Right, right. And by, the la by doing the, the, the layers first, we can target areas like, oh, that place looks, I want to visit this place to confirm if there's, you know, um, these different features here. Oh, this place looks interesting because of this and that and the other. And so you can target different areas based on the remote map, okay? Um, we typically don't do any field visits without landowner permission, okay? This is a, something we, we want the community to be involved in and, um, you know, interested people that, you know, have, have property and want us to, to review, um, we can sometimes do that. Um, and oftentimes we'll also target and try to get landowner permission from, from sites that we target, okay? And once we gather that data, uh, then we reincorporate that into the, back into the map, okay? Any questions about basically how that's conducted? Yeah. Is that information available to anyone on the computer? Uh, so when we're done, basically we typically have a report and then a digital map, which we give to the town. Okay. And so then the town, it's basically the property of the town. Okay. And so then they can... The information on the town website? I think they could post it. I don't, I don't think there's any regulations to say they have to, but they often towns do that. Yeah. How, about how long does it take? And also, how do you go about getting permission from people and who, who get, does the getting of permission? So it, it takes um, about a year for the uh, start to finish for the inventory. Uh, if it you know, has to take sh a little bit shorter, it can. If it can take longer, that's fine too. Uh, and in terms of getting landowner permission, Typically, that's the job of the Conservation Commission or other town folks. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So now I want to dive a little bit deeper into the kind of components of uh, the natural resource inventory and kind of what specifically uh, is part of the product. Okay. We start with this landscape level assessment, which is basically looking at is this forest? Is it open? Is it wetland? Is it developed? Water? What is it? Okay, and so that's kind of land cover mapping is what they call it. All right. uh, and from that, uh, we start to break down into different natural communities. Now, natural communities are basically a way that ecologists use to talk about different types of forests and wetlands. Okay. For example, we all know that the conifer forests way on top of a mountain are really different than the sugar woods you have out back or the floodplain forests down along the Lamoille, right? Well, in each of those areas, we have a classification system worked out for the different types of natural communities in the state. And that's what we use um, when we're mapping the different types of forests and wetlands. So with the wetland community assessment, we map like what, kind of, what type of natural community is it? Is it a shallow emergent marsh or an alder swamp uh, or a, a red maple black ash seepage swamp or something like that? And then we also do what's called a functional assessment. Now the, the wetland functional assessment is basically a way for wetland ecologists to determine what kind of functions and values does this wetland have that it's performing on the landscape? And this includes things like um, flood water retention. Uh, is it um, protecting water quality? Is it providing erosion control? Uh, is it important for wildlife habitat? You know, all these 10 different, um, 10 different functions and values that we assess for the different wetlands, okay? And what that does is it basically gives you an idea about how important different wetlands are on the landscape. Because okay? not all wetlands really 
say are created equal, right? They each have different, um, they do different things, okay? And some, like an old wet pasture, might not be as important as this, you know, a beautiful kind of um, marsh along the stream, okay? So this gives a way to kind of assess those and also highlight which are the most important wetlands we have in the town or in the region, okay? And we do the same thing with upland natural communities. So these are mostly uh, forests. Uh, and with the, the um, ranking protocol that we use and is used throughout the state, you can determine, okay, are the, is this a significant um, natural community? Is this, an, um, is this spot um, state, a state significant site? Okay, based on you know, what condition it's in, how rare that community type is, uh, and where it is on a landscape, okay? Now, a lot of these really re require field visits. And so that's why it's important to kind of incorporate the field assessment as part of the inventory. Right? You need boots on the ground for, to get a lot of this information. And again, it's a way for us to highlight, oh, these are, this is a really important forest in the town, you know, and these are the reasons why. Yeah. Do you use, uh, for um, people conducting inventories, do they take volunteers sometimes to gather some of this information to specific areas? Or is, I think you referenced that a conservation commission members would be maybe tasked with some of that um, outreach or getting permission. Yeah. But would there potentially be other volunteers or high school students or, you know, teachers or something that could get involved, gathering information? Yeah, I mean, we can certainly, um, you know, we can certainly work on ways to incorporate the community as much as, you know, as possible if, if that's the direction folks want to go. I th you know, oftentimes it's, uh, you know, if, with, we, we, we can take groups out, like a school group or something, and show them stuff. Um, it's hard to, to say to, say a school group, go collect me data that I can use, sure. right? But in terms of um, like having the kind of public involvement and public outreach as part of it, um, yeah, we can kind of make that part of the, part of the project, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. Or, or just, just um, as we started an inventory, maybe we had a list of people like as, as adults or mm -hmm. in a residence that would be available possibly to, to, to go out and gather information on certain areas. Yeah, I think it, it works for some type of information. Yeah. Well, um, and I, I would think that that's important from the point of view of public relations. And the issue of being welcome on people's land is a public relations issue often. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're viewed as this is an outsider of the state coming in, whereas if it's the school children coming in, and they have a task to do, maybe the significance of their data isn't that overwhelming to you, but I think it has an important task in terms of public relations and community participation and welcoming. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it really does. Children yeah. too. Sure. Yeah. Yep. yep. And there's lots of different ways to, to do that, you know. Uh, and it's just a matter of, you know, what works for the folks here. So... Yeah. Okay, then from the, uh, so we have the wetland natural community map and the land cover map and we have the, the upland natural community map. And these kind of form the basis then for developing the wildlife habitat um, information. Okay. And the, the wildlife habitat features are basically different kind of critical wildlife habitats that we can identify, sometimes just from the field and sometimes remotely, that we map out and, um, and include as part of the map, okay? So these are dewintering habitats, ledges, mast stands. Folks know what mast stands are? They're basically, um, in this case, it's hard mast. Um, you know, high protein, usually nuts from trees, okay? So it's further south, it's lots of oak. There's a few, there's some oak here. Here it's mostly beech, okay? You know, incredibly critical for um, fall for species such as bear um, and others as well, turkey and things. Anyway, um, so these are all kind of habitat features that we can map once we have the natural community mapping done. Okay. 
And again, uh, you know, gathering as much information as we can from folks um, here, especially uh, people that get out a lot uh, in the woods, um, naturalists, hunters, um, whoever, landowners, you know. And then from all that information, we uh, can map what we have been calling contiguous habitat units. And they're very similar to core forests. Uh, and a core forest is uh, a, a large tract of forest land that's, that doesn't have any fragmenting features in it. So it doesn't have roads through it, um, houses, development, or anything like that. And these are important for uh, wildlife for a wide variety of, of reasons. Um, the contiguous habitat units um, basically will include not just forest land, but um, adjacent um, and contiguous wetlands, okay, or ledge, or streams, or things, things like that. And so, um, you know, it could be that like this little arm right here is a large, you know, marsh or something, and we include that because it's really important habitat, wildlife habitat. Okay. Um, so I just. In terms of this um, statement down here, the state currently has a core forest um, for wildlife layer, uh, but it's basically done on a statewide level, and it's 10 or 12 years old, uh, and those two factors make it very difficult to work with on a local town-wide scale. And so this um, type of inventory basically gives you the information you need for actual, you know, managing and planning. Okay. Uh, the same, if I should just back up for a second, the same is true about wetlands. There is an existing wetland layer. Uh, there's a national wetland layer, and then Vermont has their own um, wetland layer. And they're good for what they are, but uh, they're also, they miss a lot and they can be fairly inaccurate. And so the, the wetland mapping that we do is just a lot uh, more solid for local level, town level planning. All right, so once we have these, um, these contiguous habitat units, so, um, or core forests, wherever you want to refer to them, we start to look at uh, travel corridors, okay, and we can uh, you know, do, there's some, some models we can run about where animals are likely to cross, okay? And then we try to get out and do some, you know, just tracking inventories, usually in the winter when we can see tracks to see where things are crossing, okay? And so we can do some, you know, some field verification, uh, you know, if possible and when we can. And so then this is the, the modeling, looking at travel routes between these, um, between these different uh, contiguous habitat units. You know, and we can rank these different um, based on the cost benefit analysis and the model for the wildlife, you know, all, all that, um, which is cool. Um, but again, field verification is the best, right? So just a summary for what these inventory components are. Okay, there's an updated map of wetlands, including natural communities and functional assessments. There's a, a upland forest map, or upland natural communities, including, if we can get to some sites, significant rankings. And then uh, the wildlife habitat. There's the significant habitat features. These are, you know, the, the uh, ledges and the mast stands and things like that. And then the, the contiguous habitat units, as well as the travel corridors. Okay. Any questions about those, the inventory, the nuts and bolts of the inventory? Yeah. What's significant about ledge areas? So ledge, uh, is, so there's a couple of species of wildlife that just uh, rely on ledge habitat. One is porcupine. <coughs> Excuse me. The other is um, bobcat. Um, they often will hunt there, but also their dens are there, and they can they can. Um, put their kits behind them and back into them for when the coyotes come and try to eat them in their kits so they can kind of hide from them in there. So I'm going to take a quick second and get something to drink here. How is the inventory used? I'll go through each one of these 
uh, just to give you a little bit of detail and, and some examples about what different towns are doing. Uh, I should, though, mention that Arrowwood's role usually ends right here. So, you know, we are scientists. We're not town planners. And we also, uh, you know, in the places we conduct inventories, we're not typically on the town boards, right? And so we usually give the inventory over to the Conservation Commission, Planning Commission, Select Board, whoever else. And then the town decides, well, what are we going to do with it, okay? Some towns don't do anything with it, okay? Other towns have used it pretty extensively. But basically, it's up to the town to decide. What are you going to do with it? Where are your priorities? Do you want to use it? Do you not want to use it? And how? So here are some examples of what folks are doing. Let's see here. Uh, so the most simple thing is uh, it's, it's good data for managing plans. And this is especially true if you actually, if we can get boots on the ground and do field visits to a site. Okay. Uh, this map is from Richmond, we did a, a town-wide inventory of, of the town of Richmond, and they came up, they decided based on that, they had a parcel they were looking at that they were thinking of buying um, to, as a town forest and putting in some trails. And so uh, they hired us to go back out to this particular parcel and do some field work to determine you know, where are the wetlands, where are the ecologically sensitive areas, you know, and then they also had a, a trail building company that we kind of worked with hand in hand, where should these, you know, kind of things be, all right? And so, just basic, you know, it's good to know what you have if you're actually managing the land. Right? It's also good for private landowners, okay? Again, if we do visit, let's say you've, you have 200 acres of forest land and you want us to visit, we do the visit as part of the inventory, and we discover, for example, ledge habitat, right? Like, oh, okay, well, here are some things you can do to preserve that for the wildlife that use it. Simple things like that, right? Uh, it's important for setting conservation priorities for the town. Whether it's, say, restoration along a stream, uh, control invasive species, uh, what areas do we want to focus on? Do we have a particular area that, that we think should be conserved? This is from the town of Warren. We did a town inventory there. They had um, this town forest. And as part of our inventory, we um, documented some wildlife travel across Route 100 and the Mad River here to get from this, um, these forests over to here. Um, it came up in the modeling and then it came up in, in when we did some field work. They were interested in this uh, because there was this other parcel that was coming up for sale. And so they hired us to go back out and do more extensive um, wildlife corridor work, set up some game cams and did more tracking. And it turns out there was a, f a lot of movement through here with wildlife. And they wound up purchasing the parcel based on that. Okay. And so in this case, you know, they were able to leverage that data that we were able to collect um, for fundraising and grant, right, grants and stuff in order to purchase the, purchase the land. Right? Uh, so in terms of broader town planning, uh, Act 171 is fairly recent and um, it talks about state and municipal planning. Okay? And on the statewide, you know, it says Vermont's forest land should be managed so as to maintain and improve forest blocks and habitat connectors. Okay. It also includes something on the municipal level. So a lot of town plans, in order to get kind of approved by the, um, the Regional Planning Commission, um, have, to have, have to indicate those areas that are important as forest blocks and habitat connectors and plan for land development in those areas to minimize forest fragmentation. Uh, that's difficult to do if you don't know where those forest blocks are and the habitat connectors are. There have been some towns that have said in their town plans, All right, we just want to regulate core forests. And you have these certain things you can't do in core forests. Uh, but don't have any 
map to determine what is a core forest, where is it, you know, where is it not. And it's basically unenforceable, you know, town regulations because it's been, you know, it's been shot down in the courts because there's, you can't, it's too vague, right? And so having, uh, you know, a specific map and specific data about where these things are is very helpful for this, this kind of thing. What's the definition of a core forest? Yeah, so um, typically something like hundreds of acres of forest where you have an interior that is um, more than, say, th I think they're usually like 300, 400 feet away from any other development. Okay, so it's basically large forest blocks is what you can think of it as. Right. Yeah. In the Act 171, is there any, um, it, it looks like a state thing, so how do towns who have a, overlapping, you know, the connectivity aspect, how do you uh, do that? Like if you're in Hardwick and your forest goes over to Woodbury or, you know, whatever, how do, how do towns work on bigger Area yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I think that folks are just starting to kind of have those conversations. Um, it, it hasn't really happened that much that I'm aware of that folks have been doing a lot of collaboration like that. I think mm. of the Lowell Mountain as an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That should you know there should have been something mm, that people could do aside from protesting. <laughs> right. I mean, it's. It's the one, it's, it is a difficult thing when you're doing an inventory of just one town. Like even for us, as we do the inventory, we've got the town boundaries, right? We usually buffer that out so that we can, you know, incorporate some of the surrounding stuff as necessary, but we can't really spend too much time in the, you know. Uh, and so looking at it isolated like that does have its, you know, downfalls uh, because obviously wildlife don't care, you know. The other uh, thing that towns sometimes do is conservation overlay districts. And these are similar to you know, other zoning overlay districts that, that um, towns have, towns with zoning. Uh, this is Jericho on the left, and then I think this is Bolton uh, on the right. Uh, again, this is all up to the town. What areas do they think that, they, that are important for them for conserving, and how specifically like what, what's gonna be an allowed use, what's gonna be a conditional use, you know? Uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into these, and there should be, certainly, because um, they can have some, you know, some ramifications in terms of town growth. And that's kind of, you know, you wanna be very, very clear about, about what you're regulating and why, right? Uh, so again, uh, lots of towns have done this, and there's, there's a lot of really good kind of templates for it as well. So, you know, once Hardwick kind of gets to that area, if they want to pursue it, there's lots of examples of how to do it. Um, similar is, you know, uh, some towns look at protecting specific resources. Um, <clears throat> one that comes to mind is uh, wetlands. Uh, the town of Woodstock did a wetlands inventory a long time ago. I think we did it in 2003 or something. And I think they were one of the first towns in the state to regulate wetlands on a local level, uh, including buffers. Uh, I think Richmond also does this now, where they have regulated wetlands. The one problem that occasionally comes up, however, is someone will say, want to build a house. They'll go to the state, and the state says, no, you're good. They build a house, but it was conflicting with a local wetland, and so it gets very confusing. Um, one thing that that um, the state has now we work closely with folks at the, at the at the state, including folks at the wetlands office, and typically when we uh, develop a wetlands map. For, the, for a town, the state will adopt that as part of their wetland advisory layer, okay? So that way, I think I have a slide with that, yeah, so, and there's a, there's a, a map of the wetlands in, um, at, on the atlas that you can look at, but if the, the state basically will adopt that, that uh, map of wetlands in Hardwick, then um, 
it's very easy for a landowner to, to see, oh, I want to develop here, they pull up the map, oh, it's on the state map, there's a wetland there, you know, I have to deal with it, kind of thing. Um, <coughs> Finally, one other thing that we've talked about previously was the potential for public outreach. Not only in getting information about the town into our mapping process, but also letting people know about uh, the natural resources that we have in the town, right? Really important, this kind of back and forth that goes on uh, between the Conservation Commission, the mapping process, and the rest of the town. We also, uh, you know, we'll have, let me just back this up here. We have, uh, typically at the end of a, pro a project, we'll put all the data up on to an online map. And we can either host it or the town hosts or whatever. So anybody that lives in town can zoom in like, oh, there's you know, a rural pool map there. Or, oh, this is a wildlife travel corridor here or whatever. They can kind of you know, interact with the data in any way that they, they want to, right? And you know, ultimately it's, it's about getting folks out into the woods, right? So like we were saying, getting kids out, um, getting community groups out, uh, getting them out in the town forest, getting them excited about these things, right? So that's, I mean, that's why, that's why I do what I do, because I'm excited about it and I love it, right? And so kind of just getting other folks out there, it's, it's a really valuable part of it, so. I mean, there's lots of um, groups that kind of take kids out and... No, I mean the, the mapping. Oh. Uh, so we haven't done... We haven't done any towns in this area. No, nope. Not in the kind of immediate surrounding area. So, yeah. So, any other questions? It must be a little frustrating that you have to restrict yourself to the boundary of the town, which really doesn't have a, a, any logic in it in terms of nature and ecosystems and stuff, right? Yes. How do you handle that? I mean, you can't follow... I just get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it's, you know, we, you know, budgets are usually tight. Like, we don't have extra time to go chasing other things. And so, it's just a reality of it. You know, I mean, we, like I say, we buffer out the, t the town boundary. So we do look a little beyond. But how um, do you mean by buffer out? How do you do that? Well, so basically, you know, I mean, instead of, we, we develop our study area. Yeah. And instead of that being exactly the town boundary, buffer it out by a quarter mile or something like that. Say, okay, that's our study area, you know. Oh, your study area isn't just the town boundaries? That's what I'm saying. Like, we usually buffer it out a little bit so that we can kind of incorporate if there's other significant things that are impacting what's in the town. Would well, you have to yeah. get permission from the adjoining town? Or how do you, I mean, there's a political issue there? No, so, I mean, we don't do field work in, the, in that area, right? We'll just do field work in the town. But in terms of the remote mapping, oh. um, that study area is just a little bit bigger. Yeah. Okay. And, and generally, you know, we don't do, you don't need landowner permission to sit on your computer and map stuff, you know, so. I don't understand remote mapping. Pardon me? I don't understand remote mapping. Yeah, so the, sorry, the remote mapping is basically when I was saying we have all those, all that data, all the layers of the soils and, and the wetlands and yeah. we make the natural communities. So a lot of that is done basically on the computer. Oh. Remotely, right? And so um, that's, that, that's that component of the inventory. And then the field where it goes through, you know, we visit as many sites as we can. Uh, but we, you can't walk the entire town to, right. to map the it. The remote mapping is dependent on data, right? And how, how is that data collected? Right, so a lot of it is already existing. Satellite imagery? There's, there's all kinds of um, imagery um, that's a, that is available that we use, as well as the soil maps and the geology maps, um, streams, things like that. And so, you know, <clears throat> for example, if I know what the soils are, and any 
just pick a place in town, right, that's not developed. If I know what the soils are, and I know what the bedrock is, and I know what the photo, what the photo looks like, mm -hmm. I can probably tell you what natural community is there. And if I can look at the photo even a little closer, I can probably tell you if there's wetlands or not, right? And this is outside the boundaries. This is just, towns. no, anywhere. And I'm talking about, this is how we would map it remotely, right? Uh, so that's basically, we use all that information and our experience to, to say, okay, I think that's what's going on here. And that's basically the remote map, because we didn't visit. And how was that remote uh, information collected? It didn't begin with it. You're Basing this on. I, I don't know, I, I must mis be missing something. Yeah, I think it's I'm not. It's already been collected by the state or uh, over the years. Oh, yes, well, I'd like to know more about that. Yeah, they're wonderful maps that do it. Mm -hmm. Say, are you involved in that kind of collecting that's done periodically when every 10 years or whatever? Mm, no. Who no. does that? Uh, usually, folks, in the state employees do that. And CRS does a lot of the soils mapping. Yep, yep. So it's different different agencies, kind of, you know. And then, you know, there's a national agricultural the imaging program or something that flies flights and takes photos every ten years or something. And so we have these going back years, and you know, we can look at land use change and things like that. If you had a look at the Agency of Natural Resources and about their website, uh, you can get all these maps. And even on the town of Hardwick, our website has a place where you can look at the maps that are already created uh -huh. for, for lots of different levels, and layers of things that have been observed and recorded over the years. It's quite impressive mm -hmm. what's, what's already there. So your agency's role is to take all that data and make the site visit on the ground to kind of make sense out of how it all fits together. Yeah. Is that basically how sure. you yeah. So are you a state agency? I no. don't understand who you are. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a private individual and I've got my own company. And so we're a private company, yep. Okay. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, so I have a few questions, um, but you, I was wondering if, once the inventory is done, if you, uh, for example, you, if everyone environmental would give recommendations on cons conservation, like based on, the, would that just be a part of the inventory? Um, yeah, so like this area should be protected because of that size. Uh, we don't generally, yeah, to some degree, yes. We, um, so setting conservation priorities like this area should be protected. Maybe not so much. Um, and that's really what, <clears throat> so we try to, that's more of a policy thing. We try to stay on the science side of it. And so we would say, you know, kind of proven management, management recommendations for, to maintain the ecological integrity of this site would be X, Y, and Z, right? And so then the town might say, oh, yeah, that would be good. Let's try to conserve that, you know? So, um, like you can prioritize. I mean, <laughs> you don't want to. I'm walking a line here. Um, so we basically we we would provide you with the uh, list of like sites that we think are ecologically kind of exceptional for these reasons. Okay. Um, and if the town wants to make those a priority, then that's the town's kind of per, you know that's their role. Okay, thank you. And um, also, I was wondering um, if you could just uh, maybe go back over any benefits that would be to private landowners other than like, their personal interest in conservation, if there are any that you can think of at all. Like, how, how would you approach this? Or how many? Yeah. I mean, it really varies. I think that if, if someone, certainly a lot of the, the um, data could be used for land management and kind of incorporated into uh, forest management plans or current use determinations. Uh, they have these things called ecologically sensitive areas um, within current use that uh, a lot of people use to, if, they, if, if an area is particularly sensitive, for example, to logging, then they could deem it 
you know, this ecologically sensitive treatment area. Uh, and so I think most of the, the benefits are, you know, increased knowledge about what's on your land and the ecological kind of significance of it, kind of putting it into a broader context uh, and being able to manage with that information. And I found my deal with zoning um, also by looking at this stuff. Mm -hmm. Anything else? <clears throat> a question, Michael. So when you're doing these field studies, <clears throat> Are you establishing, let's say, bear habitat or number of deer? Are you going by former studies and then sort of, or are you kind of reestablishing like numbers or patterns? Yeah, so we certainly don't get on the detailed level of numbers. Uh, that's really kind of far beyond the scope of the, of the inventory. Uh, I should also be clear that the town-wide inventory offers really valuable data for town-wide planning. For the parcel level, you really need field work, and oftentimes you need follow-up field work, right? Like the, the things that I mentioned in Warren and in Richmond, where they needed more information than you can get from a town-wide inventory. And so it's not until you kind of could do follow-up work that you could get anywhere close to the detail looking at numbers. Um, and so, uh, right, we're not really looking at numbers, but what we're, we are looking at is habitat, okay? And so, for deer wintering habitat, for example, uh, you know, conifer forests, south and southwest slopes, you know, certain percent canopy cover, that's the kind of thing that we can pull out of our map. Um, bear wetlands, which are wetlands that um, offer kind of uh, Groundwater discharge, so the groundwater fed. Uh, they warm up first in the spring, and so you have a lot of green leafy material before anything else, and so bear love these things when they first come out of hibernation, right? So we can identify that kind of habitat uh, based, on, based on our mapping. Okay, anything else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and thanks for your interest. And hopefully, uh, one of these days, Hardwick can uh, delve into one of these. So, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah.